but it's just that tricky thing where the person has enough language and enough social skills to appear like they're much more mature than they really are. But it's all egocentrism underneath that facade. But as I was going through your list, there's times we can all regress, right? There are temporary, oh. right? I mean, I have, you should see me on tennis court. Depending on who I'm playing, there'll be a four-year-old out there, right? you know, so. <laughs> but I mean, I realize it and I go, oh, shit, I'm, I'm embarrassed by it, right? So yeah. I'm assuming there's some kind of recognition and repentance is a bad word, but I cannot do that again. I think repentance is a fabulous word because that is what the emotionally immature person can't do. Let's say Thanksgiving is coming up. You're going to go home to your family. And let's say that your family has quite a few emotionally immature people in it. How do you approach that? Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Bounce Podcast. I'm Larry Weeks. Today's guest on the podcast is clinical psychologist and author Dr. Lindsay Gibson. Dr. Gibson has two graduate degrees in clinical psychology, including a doctorate, and she has written a very popular series on dealing with emotionally immature people, the first of which is adult children of emotionally immature parents, how to deal with the distant, rejecting, or self-involved. And on this podcast, Dr. Gibson offers up some really great advice on how to understand and deal with the high-conflict personality type, which is the hallmark of the emotionally immature. Now, we all have to deal with people who are emotionally immature, and it's not really a problem. We just go about our day. But constant engagement with such a person or being in a relationship with that personality type can be especially draining and difficult. I thought Dr. Gibson talks about some of the effects of dealing with emotionally immature. And one of the big effects is, am I crazy? You know, you come away with those interactions like, what the hell just happened? Am I crazy? What's going on? So the big benefit of this podcast, in my opinion, and her books, is insight. It's apprehending the true nature of a thing, what you're dealing with, in this case, a person. But the analogy here is, you know, for me, as soon as I get a new package, I'll say I buy something that I have to assemble, piece of furniture or whatever, I immediately try to put it together on instinct. If it looks simple, I try it without the instructions first, especially if it seems intuitive that X part goes into Y place. And I think, you know, I'm being efficient when I'm really not. And invariably, it's maddening as I try again and again. And I say to myself, okay, this should go there. Why isn't it going there? This doesn't make sense. And until I read the directions and then I'm like, oh, well, that's why it's not working. Duh. So that's the benefit of this. It, it, it'll kind of level out the insanity that you may feel dealing with this uh, high conflict personality. At least that's my opinion. And so take that to heart when you're dealing with emotionally immature people. And part of the help here is figuring out what's going on up front before you engage with such people so you can kind of know what you're dealing with. Um, and there's a risk here. The risk is, you know, as you acquire this particular knowledge about this personality type and trying to discern who is emotionally immature or not, the risk is judging people. And no one else may be encountering the person you are encountering, even though it's the same person, because they're not in that particular relationship that you are in with that person. Also be aware of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Consider yourself first. So on the show, we discuss things like that, why she wrote the book, its origin from her practice. And then, as I said, we define the EIP personality type. And by the way, this is a great exercise, as I said, to, to kind of surface what emotional maturity looks like. But we also talk about why they are the way they are. Very interesting. What causes this stunting of emotional growth in someone who is an adult? And then maybe more importantly here is really how to deal with a, somebody that's emotionally immature, or high conflict person. Because the, the podcast generally, if you're a listener for any length of time uh, to some of my other episodes, is about challenge, how to deal with challenge. And we're in relationships all the time. And, you know, this is a big deal here. You, you have to get through the day. You're working with some people. You have family members. So it could be work. It could be family. We can't choose our family. So it could be a parent or sibling. You name it. And then we talk about the single most essential factor in human relationships. And one of the reasons I enjoyed talking to Dr. Gibson about this topic 
because you start defining what's important in, in human relationships or friendships and, and what makes them good or bad or special. And then we talk about you know, where people go wrong in dealing with an EIP, what not to do. And we get into goal setting when, when you have an encounter or you have to deal with someone. What is the goal in that interaction for somebody on the opposite end of dealing with an EIP? So very useful. There's some great tips generally, especially if, if you're caught in an argument, a kind of crazy making argument with anyone, even if they may not be an emotionally immature person. There's some great tips here that apply, I think, to almost every situation when we're in relationship with someone. So I think you'll find this very interesting, very helpful. So I give you Dr. Lindsay Gibson. Dr. Gibson, welcome to the show. (laughs) Thank you for having me, Larry. It's great to be Uh, here. Thank you so much for coming on. This is an incredibly interesting topic for me. And usually I book guests based on either (laughs) where I am in my life and or the relevancy to my audience. And usually that, you know, those two things converge in in Mary. So the closest to this particular type of topic, I had Robert Sutton on. He wrote a couple of books. Uh, He wrote the book, The No Asshole Rule. I'm not saying (laughs) that emotionally immature people are assholes. I'm sure they could be, but I'm just saying that your book and, and, and this topic is very appropriate for, for my audience and the things that we talk about. And by the way, I read the book. It's great. And oh, thank you. I have a ton of questions for you. So when I was doing the research background, because I want, to, I want you to define both emotional immaturity and maturity. So I'm assuming if we define the emotionally immature person, we'll just look at its opposite and, and we can define what maturity looks like or, or vice versa. But in my research on while you wrote the book, you were noticing in your practice that the least problematic people were the ones seeking treatment. Is that right? Yes, yes. That was the most interesting thing when it finally hit me that the people that were sitting in my office that had come in for psychotherapy, and and keep in mind that when you come in for psychotherapy and you're using insurance, you're agreeing to be diagnosed and you're, in, you're agreeing that you're going to be the identified patient. In other words, you're saying, I'm volunteering for a diagnosis and a disorder in order to get help. I'm willing to have a label put on me as a person who has trouble with life in order to get help. But the people that they were describing in their life, the people that they were having trouble with, it could be you know their parents, it could be their partner or even their adult children, I'm listening to it thinking those are the people that ought to be seeking help because their behavior is out of control or immature or causing problems. And the people that I'm seeing in therapy are actually self-reflecting. They're asking themselves, what did I do wrong? Where did I go wrong? How can I get along with this person? Am I crazy? How do I deal with them throwing things at me? Whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Because the people that come in for therapy are of a type usually that tends to internalize things and try to make sense of them internally. The people that are causing difficulties in their life tend to be kind of externalizing people. That is, they blame other people for their problems. They blame circumstances. You know, it's everybody's fault, but their own. And so to me, Larry, it was so fascinating that the people who were in my office for therapy were actually coping better and were more emotionally mature than the behavior of the people that they were living with or involved with that they were describing. That got me to thinking about why is there this upside down situation where the people that are being diagnosed are the people who are actually much more capable of a healthy relationship, much more mature in their functioning. Why are they the ones who are coming in for help? And and just to kind of amplify what you're saying, we're not talking about court-ordered counseling. We're talking about people voluntarily saying, hey, here's I'm going to pull money out of my pocket. I'm going to go through the efforts of finding someone that can help me. They're self-reflective to a degree. 
that's very interesting on many levels. I, you know, in the marketing world, targeting people who, if you're selling some kind of self help information or what have you, usually the targets for that on all the great direct marketers will say it's not the people that really, really need it. It's the people looking for an edge, the people Mm -hmm. that are growing Mm -hmm. already. And mm-hmm. looking for that next thing, so uh, related, not the same, but but kind of related. Okay, yeah. so so maybe we can dovetail now on you defining the emotionally immature, mature person because that would be one of the signs is they are self reflective and they're willing to go to therapy as a as a mature. And those who are not willing to look at themselves or resistant or just won't ever go to therapy or something like that, maybe that's one flag that they may be emotionally immature. Yeah, the absence of self-reflection is a huge sign of emotional immaturity. But before I get into those differences between emotionally immature and mature people, let me just say that emotional maturity is kind of like a strand of development. It's like one line, one line of development. You've got your intellectual development. You have your maybe your social skills development. And then you have your emotional maturity development. These are all pretty separate strands. So you can have a highly intelligent, very capable, very competent in our society person who is very emotionally immature because our system is set up to reward certain kinds of behaviors that have no criteria for whether you're emotionally mature or not. You just have to be able to do these things, these competencies. So people can develop very well in other areas of their personality and yet have their emotional maturity be something that is underdeveloped. And that's something that's very confusing to people who are in relationships with them because they're they're saying to themselves, you know, my father was a doctor or my my husband is a corporate giant, you know, how can they be emotionally immature? Because they're so capable. People come to them for advice, all right? But the difference is that in the realm of how they deal with their emotions, how they deal with their self-esteem, their sense of self, how they deal with intimate relationships, that's where it begins to show up. So when you get to know somebody really, really well in a close relationship, that's when these emotionally immature characteristics will show up. Isn't it an emergent property in relationship? In other words, does it surface because of the relationships? That's a great way to put it. That's a great way to put it. Yes, it emerges, it becomes evident in the relationship because relationships go to a, I mean, a close relationship goes to a level of intense emotionality, unmet needs, childhood issues, you know, transference from your past onto the present. Yeah. Once all that stuff gets activated, that's when you're likely to see the emotional immaturity. But the interesting thing is that A lot of emotionally immature people are very socially skilled. They know how to act like they're empathic. They know how to be considerate of other people. They can stretch themselves kind of like that, that old doll, the green Gumby doll that, you know, you could, you could stretch. Mm. They can stretch themselves in the early part of a relationship to appear to be a very good mate or you know, a very conscientious, caring parent. But what happens is that when things start getting truly close, truly emotionally intimate, that's when they begin to kind of regress into their immaturity. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands that, you know, there are these different strands of development. Wow. Now I've got a ton more questions. So, (laughs) but then is it possible that someone took a course about your book and know and learn that information, but yet still be emotionally immature. Yes, of course. They would know the facts they and they, they the could facts. recite it to you. They exactly. could actually teach it. Yeah. It, I mean, well, it that's just, scary. <laughs> well, well, it's not very likely. So there's a lot of psychological assessments. So is this subjective? I mean, do assessments reveal 
this personality trait, like multiphasic personality inventory or the Beck, any of the Beck inventories, they're around depression, anxiety, but is there that type of diagnostic? No, not not okay. yet. It's mostly defined in terms of how I think about it, in terms of behaviors, behaviors and interpersonal actions. That's how it's defined now. I suppose at some point, maybe we would do research to validate an instrument that could pick up on it that way. But let me just go through the characteristics and then because I think anybody can use these as as metrics to assess whether or not the person that they're involved with may be emotionally immature. We've already talked about the poor self-reflection. They don't ask themselves the question, could it be me? Or how did I contribute to this problem? Am I being fair? They don't look back on their behavior and they don't try to take the other person's point of view as a way of understanding the situation. These are the traits that are missing. Got it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And their poor empathy, that leads us to the second characteristic, their poor empathy comes from their inability to put themselves in another person's shoes. They don't really get why the other person is doing something or how they feel. They're not interested in it, frankly. The poor empathy is particularly difficult for the child of one of these parents because you can imagine what it's like for a kid who needs comfort or needs someone to connect with them emotionally, and they can't get their parent to feel for them, to kind of instinctively know what they need in terms of their emotional needs. But with poor empathy, You don't mentalize what the other person might be thinking. You don't empathize with what they might be feeling. It's just all about you, which takes us to the third characteristic, which would be egocentrism. All roads lead to Rome. If you sit down with an emotionally immature person. It's about them. It's about them. That's what they're interested in. And their minds are always working with, um, how does this relate to my experience? So if you go to an emotionally immature person with a problem or something you need to talk about, within a few minutes at most, you're going to be talking about their experiences because they'll bring it back to that reminds me or, oh, yeah, that's just like what happened. With, you know, And pretty soon <clears throat> you find yourself empathizing with their problems. OK, so they that egocentrism is just like what we experience with four-year-olds. It doesn't take very long for the four-year-old to return to their topic of interest, does it? You know, <laughs> yeah. they're like little homing pigeons. And that's what happens with emotionally immature adults as well. It's interesting you mentioned the four-year-old. Is it kind of an age-ranged functioning behavior? They're stuck in, they're yeah, stuck I, in their I teens? Mean, or their, yeah, I yeah. mean, people, people can behave like two-year-olds. If you've ever seen a two-year-old have a tantrum and if you've ever seen a, an adult have an aggressive meltdown, very similar, okay? They're dysregulated, they're overwhelmed, they're impulsive, they're aggressive, okay? But it could be a, like, they could be emotionally immature like a 15-year-old or like a six-year-old. These are all developmental characteristic phases that they could resemble. But I like to use the four-year-old as sort of the general set of characteristics because four-year-olds have the language and they have enough thinking ability to seem like you could reason with them, but try to reason with them (laughs) or don't give them what they want. (laughs) And you'll quickly find out how immature that little person really is. But it's just that tricky thing where the person has enough language and enough social skills to appear like they're much more mature than they really are. But it's all egocentrism underneath that facade. Another characteristic is that just like a four-year-old, reality is what I feel it is. This is a um, characteristic called affective realism, uh, named that by uh, Lisa Barrett and her colleague Barr, which means that if a situation feels to me like 
you don't love me, you're out to get me, you don't care what happens to me. That's the fact. That's the truth. I don't check it out with you. I don't talk to you about it. I just know that that's the truth because it feels like that to me. Or if I think you're the greatest thing ever, and I'm sure that you can be trusted and you know they will go with that. But that affective realism means that your ability to reason with them and get them to see your reality, to get them to see you, is very limited. That's not something that they, they're going to do because they're convinced that reality is what they feel it to be. And that's true of four-year-olds too. Like, you're mean. You don't love me. Uh, you don't want me to be happy. But these are... I would assume more consistent defaults that are always there versus because as we're going through the list, and by the way, I read the list because job number one is to make sure I'm not emotionally immature. And where am I on the scale and make sure that, that I'm behaving in, in a mature way emotionally. And by the way, I'm uber reflective. So I, I mean, I, I constantly say, what's wrong with, what did I do? You know, but I'm still want to make sure that I'm not being that or, but as I was going through your list, there's times we can all regress, right? There are temporary, oh. right? I, I mean, I have, you should see me on tennis court, depending on who I'm playing, there'll be a four-year-old out there, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> but I mean, I realize it and I go, oh, shit, that, I'm embarrassed by it, right? So yeah. I'm assuming there's some kind of recognition and repentance is a bad word, but I cannot do that again. I think repentance is a fabulous word, because that is what the emotionally immature person can't do. Ooh, they, okay. they don't reflect on themselves. They don't seek amends. They don't try to make up for what they did. They don't make a note, you know, note to self, don't implode on the tennis court. That, that doesn't occur to them. It's more like, I can't believe what that so-and-so did on the tennis court today, blah, blah, blah. They're just not interested in trying to understand other people or situations. They're going to go for the thing that relieves the most tension in them at the moment. Lots of times what happens in relationships is they don't do the emotional work that's necessary to help relationships stay on an even pleasant keel because they don't self-reflect and they don't say, I'm sorry, and they don't think they need to make amends. You can imagine all the unfinished business there is in that relationship and all I, the hurt feelings. Yeah. I, I would assume they would drop the relationship. The, the, the relationships would just come to a stop. There wouldn't be a pickup or a, well, uh, I don't some, know. Lots of times that does happen, but other times it can deteriorate into kind of a hostile dependent relationship, you know, where, where there's a lot of fighting then they come back together and oh, we love each other. And then there's a lot of fighting. So there's, you know, that kind of hostile under what's hostile dependent. That's interesting. That's where, you know, I hate you. Don't leave me. I think actually that's the title of a book. It's where you are very emotionally dependent on the person because you don't have really a good sense of yourself. So you really need that other person to complete yourself. And yet you have so many unmet psychological and emotional needs and maybe so much trauma in your back. But they don't show the need. Do they not show the need? Not until or, later okay. in the relationship. Got yeah. It. Okay. Although sometimes right. it shows up earlier. But basically that the anger and the hostility and the hurt that's left over from these previous traumas comes flooding into the relationship. And this thing gets acted out where there's a lot of, you know, a lot of fighting, a lot of hostility. And yet the two people are very emotionally dependent on each other. You can have very yeah. long-term relationships that are characterized by that kind right. of back and forth. Right. Is Uber defensiveness? Yes, a, a trick? yes, yes. Great, great word. I say because, Uber just, uh, I mean, we all get defensive at times, but. That's the right but, word. Uh, it really, it truly is Uber because that's the way I ultimately came to understand and have I guess, sort of a compassionate objectivity about emotionally immature people. They're not being this way to torment other people or to be egocentric for the sake of being egocentric. They, they are developmentally stuck 
because they have had so much pain in their own life. They've not had the opportunity or the support to really grow up emotionally. They haven't had the the secure attachment or the parent who listened to them or helped them develop uh, their sense of empathy or right and wrong, repentance, you know, they may not have gotten any help with that. And instead, they become super sensitized to any kind of threat, especially to their self-esteem or their sense of stability. And so they depend on other people to build up their self-esteem, keep them stable, and that becomes this expectation that they have for other people. And anything that seems like a threat, even if it isn't, I'm assuming, but if it looks like it smells like whatever, it's, you know, if it's in the ballpark, they're going to erect a wall or something. Exactly. Um, And it's, and it's instant hair trigger. They don't have a choice. So when people say, you know, I can't believe she said that to me, or how can my father be so cold or, you know, whatever, what they're really saying is where did the person go that I love and have a relationship with? How could they, how could they change like that and treat me so badly? Well, the reason it's not you, it's their it's their defense, their fear, their defense, their fears. Yes. That's going to come in so quickly that they really don't have a choice about sitting down and saying, gosh, I, you know, I really, it would be better for me to be more empathic and think about, you know, my son's feelings or my wife's issues that she's talking about right now, this would be good time for me to be empathic. No, if it, if it steps on their self-esteem or it steps on their sense of security, boom, they're right there with the defensiveness, anything. Uh, And it's no holds barred. It's anything that will make them feel better about themselves in the moment. I just wanted to park there for a brief second for those who are listening, going or in this kind of dynamic with a family member or whatever relationship, even at work, uh, I don't know, but it's not about you. Don't get destroyed by this because they're probably asking themselves over and over, what did I do? What did I do? What, you know, or I'm bad, I'm bad or something like that. So because you mentioned developmentally stuck, then I assume they're because of this, you, you, you alluded, or I, I should say you actually said it in their childhood, somewhere along the lines, they were stuck because of the lack of some whatever these needs weren't being met at, yeah. in childhood somewhere or is this a childhood origination or is this something that uh, young adults can be flipped in other words something traumatic happens or i really want to know why why are they like this let's look at it like building a house okay like personality development is similar to building a house in that you have to have a beginning, you have to have a foundation, you have to have the first floor, then you have to have the walls and you have the second floor. And it's a construction, very complicated construction. And anything can go wrong with that. That's why emotional maturity is such a a beautiful to me because of how much goes right to enable a person to have adequate maturity. So it wouldn't be like a person develops just fine until they're 17 or 21 or whatever. And then suddenly they develop emotional immaturity and go back to being that emotional four-year-old again. No, if they've gotten the house built, the house is not going away. We can all regress when we get sick or tired or stressed. Okay, we all become egocentric. We um, lose our empathy for other people. Life looks like what we're feeling like. You know, things become very gloomy when we're tired or sick. That's normal. That kind of regression is normal. But we, to use the name of your program, we bounce back. <laughs> you know, we, if, we, if your house is basically sound in its, in its construction, you will bounce back from these. It will sway or it, yes. will, it can be shaken, but it yes. will stand. Got it. Exactly. Yeah. But for emotionally immature people, it can be either that their emotional needs weren't met that would enable them to keep growing emotionally. Like if you get enough empathy or love or attention, Uh, from your parent, 
you begin to develop a good sense of self and you begin to learn that loving other people is safe and that other people can be counted on and you know you develop on from there but let's say that you have a trauma let's say that something happens to you it could be some kind of abuse it could be you know a physical injury it could be a physical condition but something that interrupts that child's sense of being and is shocking to their system if a parent is not emotionally aware enough to be able to connect with the child in that state that trauma state never gets metabolized it never gets worked through or comforted or it, it kind of sits there in the personality and so that's why it's so critical how children are related to not only for their basic emotional needs but when things go wrong you know do they feel a sense of support and understanding from their parent that helps to strengthen them and helps them in the future to feel resilient like i can overcome this well they get that feeling originally from the fact that somebody else was there to help them overcome things and that gets internalized as i can do that i'm confident the world is safe and when kids don't get that that's when you get that very shaky sense of self and the you know the tendency to become highly defensive you know because you feel insecure about yourself yeah people can become emotionally immature for many reasons but it's going to be because some need of theirs didn't get met at the developmentally necessary time and then that shows up later in their intimate relationships so for the audience listening they've identified they're in that type of dynamic with someone whether work family member could be a parent because i i think your book was targeted toward the emotionally immature parent and child dynamics right so let's say they're ding ding the bells are ringing they're like okay that's what's going on let's talk about how to deal with those type of people i hate the way i phrase that but how to interact in the relationship or when i say deal because you know i, I was reading your book a lot of these people let's just say there's somebody emotionally mature but they're dealing with somebody emotionally mature often reflect poorly on themselves thinking man am i going crazy right what is going on but your book kind of addresses what's happening and and, and there's some insight there so <laughs> hopefully people are feeling a little better that they're not crazy but but there is that dynamic but they're in you know unless they drop their family member or whatever if they want to stay in the relationship how do they do it without going crazy i guess partly realizing it's not them we we mentioned that but is there a way to communicate is there a way not to communicate yeah very much so uh in fact i would say that two of my books are you know much more toward the pragmatics of how to get along with these people or how to deal with them uh and then the original book the adult children book that was the theory uh essentially but when you're trying to get along with people who are emotionally immature like that's a better way to put it <laughs> yeah maybe a maybe a, it could be a family member it could be a spouse it could be uh an old friend or an old distant relative or but somebody that you have an investment in you don't want to give up the relationship you have a bond a bond is different from a relationship people need to understand that i think because just because you have an emotional bond with somebody does not mean that you have what you would call a relationship with them john bolby who was a one of the original attachment researchers said that bonding was caused by familiarity and proximity that's who children bond to so that physical presence and that physical closeness of proximity and the familiarity we are triggered into bonding under those conditions just normally now to have a relationship though it means a relationship means that you communicate with the other person there's an understanding of each other there's a respect for each other there's an interest in each other 
you see the other person as a separate individual from yourself. You relate to them as a separate individual. It's very different. But let's say that, to be pragmatic, let's say Thanksgiving is coming up. You're going to go home to your family. And let's say that your family has quite a few emotionally mature people in it. How do you approach that? We can think about it in terms of how do we how do we deal with people when we have to go back into the family system that may have some emotionally immature people in it. So Thanksgiving is coming up. Suppose we're going home and our family has a number of people who, or maybe just one or two, who are emotionally immature. What is the attitude or what is the behavior that we want to show? in order to get along the best we can. Well, first you want to think about what is the optimal distance that you need to keep in order to not get sucked into the kind of conflicts or disappointments or emotional reactivity that are typical of emotionally immature people in those kind of situations. So let's say that you decide this time I'm going to go for two days instead of five days, because I have found that every time I'm up there for more than two days, things start to deteriorate, or I get into it with my father or, you know. So you can begin to think about what is the optimal distance where I can maintain my own individuality as I relate to them before I get sucked into being very reactive to them. So what I advise people to do is to make sure that they try their best to be observational and to make sure that they stay in touch with themselves when they're in that situation. So I uh, suggest that they pay attention to their breathing. They pay attention to any tension in their body. And they try to maintain self-awareness and self-presence when they're interacting with the emotionally immature person. And you want to focus on the outcome, like the outcome that you want from Thanksgiving, for instance, might be to have a pleasant time and leave without getting into a disagreement with anybody. That's your specific outcome. Set the outcome up front in your mind. Don't wander in and let them start saying things or taking pot shots to start a fight. Be prepared for how you want it to go. And so your orientation is to manage the situation with some detachment and observation and to name what you're seeing. So you would want to have a a kind of a running narrative in your mind, like, oh, that's what they're doing. This is that thing about egocentrism. This is they they're not going to self-reflect. Yep. This is the defensiveness. I mean, you keep up that narration and it helps you to stay in yourself. It helps you to keep that awareness of who you are and what you're trying to accomplish in in the visit. But if you try to get into either rescuing somebody or fighting with somebody or some effort to change the other person, things are going to go badly. That doesn't give up hope on the change side. You work at that. <laughs> yeah, no one can no one can do that the first time out of Try, the gate. Okay, but you're saying change is that is should not be your goal. I it may be hard to give that up, but you're saying that don't count on that. That's not going to happen. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. A more positive goal would be, I'm going to change myself. I am going to change my reactivity to them. So I'm going to detach a little bit. I'm going to remain self-aware. I'm going to think about that optimal distance where we can have the best possible interactions. I'm going to manage this. I'm not going to fall into it and become reactive. I'm going to lead the interaction. I'm going to try to take it where I want it to go and stay out of the, you know, the potholes 
that usually happen uh, on these visits. And I'm not going to be passive. I'm going to actively change the situation if it becomes too much for me. Like I'm going to leave. I'm going to step outside. But lots of times people do better when they decide to be kind of slippery and sidestep the challenges that come up with emotionally immature people. Is that ignoring? It could could, could be ignoring. It could be saying, well, yeah, well, I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree. Oh, I see. Uh, just- it's just you're slippery. You're sidestepping. You're not allowing yourself to get caught up. You're not being the- angry. You're you're stating right. what you will and won't do, but you're just not playing the emotional game. Forgive me. Is that Ex- exactly know, yes? The way you say it. Okay, so you said slippery. It's a boxing metaphor, sort of. Yeah. More. You're right. Exactly. It's like you're, you know, exactly. you're, you're pairing the the thrust versus being sneaky. You're just trying to mm-hmm. glance the blows. So mm-hmm. let's talk about boundaries. You know, either saying no or asking for something that is seems to be an imitation of quicksand where there is something I need, want, MO, whatever it is. I'm assuming, do, I mean, do you give up on that? I mean, do you just not ask for it or do you know the answer? You, you know what's coming, but you state it for the record. That's a great question. Boundaries are incredibly important for relationships with emotionally immature people. That's the work here to be able to set a boundary or set limits on things according to what is suitable or healthy for yourself. And of course, emotionally immature people, just like four year olds, don't like other people's boundaries and limits. It's very frustrating and upsetting to them that they're not being allowed to do whatever they want. And of course, adults are much more sophisticated than four-year-olds. And so they come up with a million moral, ethical, (laughs) societal reasons why you should be doing what they want you to do, okay? It really does a head number on you. But it's all about coercion. So when they try to get you to kind of be who they need you to be so that they'll feel good. Your job is to set boundaries, set limits on, you know, like something as basic as how long you will listen to this or how long you will talk about it this time. Okay. You might have to say to them, mom, I really respect what you're having to, what you have to say to me, but you know, I'm so tired. I didn't sleep well last night. Can we table this and maybe talk about it again tomorrow? That's a very gentle way of setting a boundary on something that's very unpleasant. There are just a number of ways that you can be kind of, like you you were saying, you're pairing the thrust, you're changing the situation toward what is better for your emotional stability. But are you giving up hope from the standpoint of the results that you're asking for? Or at least expect that where I'm going to ask for this or set the boundary, but I don't have hopes that that's going to go well or it's going to be agreed upon. That's true. It may not go well. It may not be agreed upon, but it's very important when you choose a boundary or you set a limit for yourself and you really believe that's what you need as a healthy thing for yourself, then we just switch into perseverance and repetition. You persevere through it. You keep stating the limit. You might say you might be empathic to their distress. Like, I know this is hard on you. I know this is different, dad, but this is what I need to do. And you keep repeating it until the boundary is accepted. Or if it's not accepted, you may decide that you're going to take a little break from having contact with them because this is just too hard. It's just too painful. You can decide that. Really, repetition of boundaries is the single thing that emotionally immature people have no defense for because (laughs) they're so accustomed to getting what they want by acting unpleasantly and by emotionally coercing other people with guilt and shame and fear that they're not accustomed to someone who keeps coming back with the same request or the same boundary, 
they're really not prepared for that long haul of boundary setting. And so after a while, they tend to get kind of uh, nonplussed and, and sort of acquiesce because they don't know what else to do at that point. But you have to understand that your job is to have, is to state your boundaries and force it in the sense that, you know, I'll have to stop interacting for a while if we can't agree on this boundary. That's your job. And it's not up to you to have them like it or receive it well, but it's your, your power lies in your repetition of knowing what's best for you or best for your family. And that's, and that's what really tends to work the best is that kind of perseverance and repetition. Is there any case where the relationship has to end or there has to be some kind of demarcation or cutoff? I'm assuming there's levels of emotional immaturity, right? There's crazy level versus uh, maybe that's a part of it, but is, is that just a subjective, can I handle it anymore kind of a thing? Or is there signs someone should notice that it's beyond managing or dealing with? Yeah, it could be, uh, can I handle this anymore? It can also be, do I want to keep handling this? Am I sick and tired of this? Do I need to take a break? You know, there can be different reasons and different levels why you might choose a period of taking a break from each other, or it may turn into an estrangement where you don't have contact for long periods of time. So basically, if there is abuse going on, or there's crazy making going on, if there is so much emotional loneliness in the relationship, because you I think I forgot to say this earlier, but emotionally immature people have a lot of trouble with emotional intimacy. They don't yeah, that was like prominent to, in your book. Yeah, yeah, they don't like to go into that emotional nitty-gritty thing of getting to know each other at a very deep level. That makes them intensely uncomfortable. So when you're in a say a marriage with somebody who keeps distancing themselves or starts fights or otherwise won't allow themselves to enter into a truly intimate, close relationship with you, you get intensely lonely. And you may decide that you don't want to continue the relationship because it's just too painful being that lonely, (laughs) even when you're married to someone. So these kinds of things may be reasons that people decide to become estranged, or there could be, you know, a, a big incident where somebody's behavior was so insulting or so out of control that, you know, you just want to take a break from the relationship completely. But whatever it is, it should be decided on the basis of what's best for you, for your physical health, but also for your psychological health. You can tell when somebody's bad for you, you know, you stay stirred up about them or it's painful being around them, or you feel disrespected or treated badly. These things all sort of add up and contribute to a person's decision not to continue in the relationship for the time being. You can always keep in mind that later on, you may be willing to try again. But decide from the standpoint of what it's like for you right now. And if taking a break seems to be the only way that you can get yourself back, that's when I would think that it could be a good idea for a break. You talk about in in how to cope uh, in the moment with emotionally immature persons, uh, family members, what have you. You know, you say things like, you know, from a calm thinking perspective, rather than emotional reactivity, you know, approach the interaction. You even, you you gave a technique that was, I thought was interesting from a perspective is to look at it as an anthropological field study, right? Like uh, you're just, you're just studying behavior. And so I I think that's great, but man, I bet you that's super hard in the moment to do. Is there any trick to that, to changing that perspective or changing that frame of mind or getting that frame of mind and, and holding it? That's a major thing to be aware of. You have to do it in advance of the visit, of it, in advance of the interaction. 
if you prepare an, for yes, okay. absolutely. You have manage to be, your expectations. Right? Manage your expectations, but you also have to be mentally prepared that this is the outcome I want. I want to set the boundary about whatever. I'm not going to back down on that. I don't want to get in a fight. I'm going to stay calm. I'm going to repeat my position. And if things get too difficult, I'm going to excuse myself and go back to the hotel or whatever, take a drive or go outside. So if you go in prepared, both mentally and emotionally, you're in a much better position of dealing with the situation. If you go in you won't be caught off guard if you exactly. set your expectations that, hey, this is likely going to go bad or this, I'm going to yes. get this kind of feedback. So just be ready. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Because if you go in uh, making it up as you go along, the emotionally immature person is a master of taking over interactions and bending them to their own dramas or their own psychological needs. Okay. You will be cannon fodder. Um, if you go in without thinking about what you're trying to accomplish and without sort of cultivating a healthy detachment to protect yourself with. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's a, that's a shame, but necessary. I, yeah. Yeah. You can't um, shoot from the hip and be accurate. You know, you have you, to be prepared. You have a great line about setting a goal. And one of the goals could be expressing your true thoughts and feelings in a clear and calm way. In other mm -hmm. words, the goal is not, I'm going to have a great outcome. I'm going to be understood or whatever, but the goal is on my side of it. Hey, I'm just going to make sure I express what I'm feeling very clearly and calmly. Like, yes. You know, and, and, and I have so many people that I've worked with who, when you get to a certain point of understanding the emotional immaturity and what it's done to you and what you need to change, and you go into a situation where you express your true thoughts and your or your true feeling or your true request, it is so empowering to them to do that, even if the result is not what they want, even if the person refuses or doesn't listen, doesn't uh, respect them. It's still such a good feeling to have been able to be yourself in the presence of people who are trying to get you to serve their emotional needs. It's tremendously empowering just to be able to express yourself because emotionally immature people shut other people down and, you know, subtly or explicitly coerce them into becoming who they need them to be. So anytime you operate out of your true self and communicate calmly and clearly what you feel and believe, you're going to feel much better when you come out of that interaction. And that's what we're think, shooting for in the in the therapy or in the coaching. Yeah, I think you say if you're feeling distress, it's a sign some kind of fantasy has kicked in. You yeah. you are expecting something that just can't happen, is not going to happen. And you've got to let that go. I think you also have a line that says <laughs> if your goal I like the way you put it. If your goal is empathy or change of heart, stop right there. <laughs> I thought that was helpful. That's a dead end. You're going the wrong way. Yeah. Great book. Is there another in this particular type of series? Or I have uh, several books in this series. Uh, the first one is The Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents. And then the next one is Recovering from Emotionally Immature Parents. And then there's another one about self-care, a book on disentangling yourself from emotionally immature people is coming out in July of 2023. So that's the one that uh, just turned in the manuscript for that recently. So uh, yeah, there are multiple books in the series and I you know, do a lot of work with people around the country for this kind of uh, this kind so of you're coaching. still in, you still have a practice uh, yes. around these. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. And where can people find you? Yeah. Like if you? Uh, people want to get in touch with me, I recommend that they just Google me and my okay. office information will come up. I also have a website. Uh, it's Dr. Lindsay with an A, Dr. Lindsay Gibson.com. And people can go there for uh, various writings and articles and blog posts, that kind of thing on the website. Yeah. 
And your books are everywhere. Books are sold. They're on Amazon and Google Books and what have you. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Is there anything else we should make a point of saying that I didn't have the foresight to ask about? Um, the only thing that I would add to our conversation, Larry, is that emotionally mature people make you feel seen and safe. You feel like you can be yourself around them. You feel like you are seen and and understood and respected, and they are able to handle the normal vicissitudes of relationships without becoming defensive and upset about things. So I just want to emphasize, you know, by way of closing, that there are plenty of people who are emotionally mature as well, and you can tell who they are over time. You have to give a relationship time to develop to really see who that person is. And you will feel comfortable and safe with an emotionally mature person because they will receive you as an individual and as a valuable human being in a way that will make you feel relaxed and very safe. So I just encourage people. At the end of the first book, there's uh, a series of characteristics of emotionally mature people that people can check out there because it's it's important to be able to tell the difference. You said over time, is that type of recognition something that can't happen fairly quickly in an interaction with an individual? It's something that, as we talked at first, it's an, this is emergent property. Is it something you can discern fairly quickly? If you know what you're looking for, you can see it very quickly, but it may take time. I mean, if the person is is very socially skilled, if they want something from you, they may act in ways that really cover up that emotional immaturity. And really the only way to be sure is to be in a relationship with a person for a while, you know, over months, uh, for instance, or it could be uh, longer than that where you see how they handle stress because emotionally immature people don't handle stress well and emotionally mature people do. So that is really- So this is an important trait yeah. in a CEO and a political yeah. leader. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not just a, a knowledge base because those things are fraught with stress. Those leadership positions are fraught with stress. So if you go sideways- during a stressful time, that's that's the worst time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Uh, well, this has been great. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my great pleasure. Thanks for having me, Larry. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed it, do share it with your friends and on your social platforms. Big thanks to Sam Williams, my audio guy. And the beautiful bumper music you're hearing is Michael Petrovich's Bella Luna. For all my show notes or resource links, visit LarryWeeks.com, and we will talk again soon. Mm -hmm.